here and can you hear me still? Okay. So this was unduly complicated. Um, our, yeah? Um, don't worry about opening anything up right now. Um, what I, I guess I can show you. Uh, yeah, I guess I can. Um, okay. How's this thing? Is that other way around? <laughs> Like that? Okay. 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 Right. We good now? All right. So this is what I did. I tried to make it easier, and of course that never really works, right? Um. So what I did for you all. was um, I put together some notes that I thought would be helpful for a first time person learning R. And so I will distribute these to you all afterwards. Um, so for example, for the intro to R is somewhere right there. So I, I compiled them as a PDF so you can go through and have all of the code and there's little explanations for everything. So I'm going to go through this code right here um, on the presentation and so you all have it later. I guess I could have given it to you now but um, we had a little technical issue this morning so um, so that's what I'll be doing. Does that work for everybody? Okay. So. Now we can get started. So how many of you all have a working relationship with R? How many of, okay, so most of you all. Uh, some of you don't. Um, how many of you have never even opened it once in your lifetime? Okay, so it's like half and half, I guess. Um, so basically, why, why would you want to use R? So R is a, it's a statistical language, it's a programming environment. Um, it's free. So you never have to pay for it. It's open source. Anybody can contribute to it. Anybody can add to it. Uh, you can make it your own. Um, it, also, it also has a huge growing and active community that is very involved in developing it as a statistical language, as a data management language, um, and also as uh, extra little things that you can do. Like this whole presentation was made through R, um, which ended up being kind of a pain in the um, ass, but uh, it shouldn't have been, and it was, yeah. So it's an object-oriented language, uh, and it has really nice statistical properties. Um, you can do really nice graphics in it, and you can manage your data in it also. So what do you guys usually use for your data management? MATLAB? Okay. SPSS? Okay, so these are like statistical type things. But most everybody, when you open up a, a, a spreadsheet, you open it up in Excel, right? You have, your, you have your data in long form where you have your columns and your rows. Um, and R is really good at managing data in that sense. Um, and one of the problems with using Excel for a lot of data manipulation type things is there's no record of what you actually did. So how many times have you opened up an Excel spreadsheet and thought, did I actually convert that or did I transform those numbers or anything like that? And if you, if you don't uh, have any record of it, you never can really know. So what R really shines at is making a very robust and repetitive or um, repeatable and clear language of everything that you've done. So it's different than MATLAB in a couple of ways. Mostly it, it stores all of its, um, it, it does all of the calculations within RAM so it can be bogged down by large data sets, but it's getting better at that. Um, and if anybody has anything to add who's, uh, I'm sure that there's people who are way more advanced in R than I am, but uh, if, so if anybody has anything else to yell out, go for it. Um, so some hopefully helpful advice for people getting started in R. Um, I think I started in 2007 or 2008, and I had never done any computer programming or anything before. I'd, you know, I had done all of my calculations in SPSS or 
uh, just wrote little things in, in Excel. Uh, and so when I started, I was terrified because I saw this blank screen and I was supposed to tell it what to do. Um, there's a huge, um, th there's a couple of different ways that you can go about finding help. Uh, first is on your own. R has really nice help files built in, so all of the functions, uh, which we'll talk about later, have help files associated with them. And uh, sometimes they're a little bit uh, confusing. Uh, so that's the next step, is to ask for help. Uh, I think I always have a search window open for Google that I constantly type stuff in. When I'm, when I'm writing things in R, it's like, crap, what, do, what was that? Uh, okay, search it in Google, that's what it is. Okay, I remember now. Um, and so there's a huge active, uh, active group of people that are really working hard on, um, on developing this program. So I guess uh, also Stack Exchange. How many have you all used Stack Exchange? So it's, it's sort of like a, a web community where you can ask a question and then people generally answer them in a somewhat pedantic, uh, insulting way. But it's not as bad as it has been. Um, so, so Stack Exchange can be a, can be a good resource. But, um, but if you ask a question, you really have to make sure that you have a good example that repeats the problem that you're having. And so if you, if you have a problem with something in your own data set, you should try to repeat it in an artificial data set that you make up. And then it's a lot easier for other people to just open up the problem on their own computer and say, oh, well, you're doing this wrong. You have a comma misspecified, or you have you know, something in the wrong order. So um, that's a good trick to, to try to, to create a minimal example where it's just the, this, uh, the most important parts to your, to your problem. Um, and then you can ask somebody for help. And I say that people can be a little bit intimidating, but generally everyone's really nice and um, it's just different personalities, right? So, um, but most importantly, just keep trying. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've just been absolutely infuriated that I can't figure something out to go for a coffee or go for a walk or wake up the next morning and, or take a shower and realize, oh, <laughs> that's it. That's so easy. Why didn't I think of that earlier? Anything that you can, anything that you can think of, you can, you can solve, um, well, most everything you can think of, you can solve with R. Um, and it doesn't necessarily come to you right away. So keep trying and keep going at it. Um, so R syntax. Uh, so we, um, you assign data to an object, right? So here, here I say that 10 is X, right? So this is pretty straightforward for those of you that use MATLAB or anything like that. Um, and there's a couple of different assignment uh, operators that we'll discuss in a minute here. And so when, when you type x, you get 10. So x equals 10, right? So that's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and with these, you can, uh, you, can, you can do multiplication. You can do all sorts of stuff. Um, so here, if you type 10 times 10, you get 100. Go figure. So there's a couple of different assignment operators. There's the equal sign and there's the arrow, which is um, on the US uh, keyboards, it's the shift comma, um, uh, shift comma and then the minus sign. Um, and it's kind of awkward at first, but now m my fingers are like trained to that little, uh, that little action. And so it's good practice to use the arrow assignment because the equal sign assignment uh, can also be used within, um, within uh, functions and it can get kind of tricky if other people are looking at your code. So um, that's another thing I, I meant to add also is uh, as with any language, there's, a, uh, there's proper style or proper grammar. Um, and so there's a couple of different proper grammars for R and one of them, uh, Google has a, a guidelines for our programming that you might want to look up. I included it in the P PDF. Um, and so basically it, it specifies where you should put spaces and, and how you should uh, orient things to make it most easy for other people to read. So that's another great thing about R is you can share your code and anyone can use it. And you know, uh, So you can also use the reverse of the arrow. Um, so for example, here we can create a vector uh, and we can assign that vector C1 through 10 to an object called V1. Um, 
this next bit right here is using a function. So this is a random normal distribution of a length 12 with a mean of 40 and a standard deviation of, of 2.5. So this is a function, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I assigned it using the equal sign there. And then you can combine these two vectors uh, using the, uh, the reverse operator. But I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't really use that. So, yeah, go for it. So the C, I'll get to that later, but that means concatenate. I can't say that word. How is it? Concatenate? What? Concatenate, yeah, right. So it means basically combine all that stuff together. And so, uh, so that just basically creates a vector of all of, those, um, all of those numbers. So within R, you can have a couple of different types of, um, of objects. You can have numeric objects, you can have character strings, and you can have um, uh, lists and all sorts of stuff. But with uh, characters, you just need to make sure that you put it in quotation marks. You can use either single or double quotation marks. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Any other questions? I'm sorry. If I'm jumping around a little bit. but. So when you name an object, there's a couple of guidelines that you need to keep, uh, keep in mind. So earlier I used this v1, v2, um, v3, and that's fine. But it doesn't really tell me anything about those, uh, those pieces of information. Um, so it, need, it needs to be descriptive of what you're actually holding in that data frame. Um, you can use capital letters, you can use periods, and you can use underscores. So you can use combinations of those to make uh, short and descriptive uh, um, uh, descriptors of your names for your objects. So here I could name it vector of numbers. And so this is the, I don't know if other countries call it camel, uh, camel case or, or what. Um, so basically if you have uppercase and then a string of lowercase letters and then another uppercase and then so when you, when you want to specify different words, you just change the case. Um, or you can use a period or an underscore. And so all of those are good. What I, try to, what I try to do when I'm writing code is I try to have objects named as, as one type and then functions named as another type. So if I want to make functions, I'll maybe use an underscore to describe the name. Whereas if I'm making an object that holds data, I'll use the camel case or the period. So that's just a little, um, a little way that you can clarify your, your, um, your code a little bit. But remember, it's, you're typing all of this, so it's, it's best to keep code uh, short and sweet, right? So instead of doing vector of numbers, you can do something like numvec, right? So it's the same information, it's just shorter to type and easier to, easier to use. And easier to forget. And easier to forget, yeah. <laughs> so that's another thing right here. So, um, when you include the pound sign or the, the number sign right there, that comments, that creates a, um, a break in the code, so that, that allows you to put a comment there. So when it's in this green color here, that means that it actually didn't run and it was just as a comment. And so when you're writing, uh, when you're writing names for vectors or names for objects or whatever, it's really helpful to add a comment like, hey, I couldn't remember what else to name it, so I decided to name it number, num number vector or whatever, right? And so when you're handing code to other people, it's really helpful to have really descriptive code that has lots of good um, comments in it. Um, and it, it won't run, and, and so here are a couple of examples of, of names that won't work. You can't start a name with a, a number. You can't have a special case, like the ampersand there, and you can't you can't overwrite an, exist, an existing function. So as we mentioned earlier, C is uh, concatenate. <laughs> um, and so it's best not to write over that because if you go uh, use that in the future, it'll still be concatenate, but it'll just be very confusing because basically then you have renamed a function. So uh, that'll work, but don't do it. And there's a bunch of, of, um, of shorter little uh, little function names like square root, c, t, and so on. I guess etc isn't one, so you could use that, but anyway. Um, so when you create data, so here's, here's this 
uh, that we've discussed already. So uh, when you put within parentheses, so a function is followed by parentheses. Um, so within the function, you, you put a list of, or, or a string of, of what your object wants to be, what you want your object to be. So here, when you hit return, you'll have that same uh, vector of numbers. And so you can assign, using these assigning operators that we discussed earlier, you can assign the, um, this group of numbers as x2, okay? So you can also use, instead, of, if you didn't want to type all of those numbers, you can also use the colon, which uh, allows you to use a sequence between new, two numbers. So here it's between 21 and 30, and 8,011 and 8,020. Um, so we can, we can use that type of notation also. Um, and then there's also a couple of functions that, um, that create a, a sample of random or otherwise distributed data of a length of n. So here we have this uh, random uniform function where you, we want 10 numbers, we want the minimum of zero, and we want a maximum of one. So it'll just pick out 10 numbers from within that range in a random uniform sampling design. So we can have vectors and then we can have matrices. So, so matrices are just uh, columns of vectors or rows of vectors, right? And so we can combine. So another great thing about R is that you can nest functions within itself. You know, you can, you can create this really long function that has a whole bunch of other functions built within it. Uh, so here, um, the first function that will be called is to create a, um, a group of these five uh, objects that we already assigned earlier. And then it creates a matrix of it with 10 rows, right? So then when you look at uh, this function head, it just looks at the header. So it's the first, uh, I think, six rows or something like that. So then we can see, OK, here's the first, the first column, the second column, the third column, the fourth column that we that we assigned uh, as objects earlier. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that? If you wanted to change how the matrix is oriented, you can change that to um, the number of rows is four, and then it would go across, right? So there's a bunch of different um, constants that are built within R. You have months and years, uh, I guess years wouldn't be one. You have months and colors and, and letters and so on. And so if you want to access something within an object, you use these square brackets here. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but here if I want the, the third through twelfth letter, I use that sort of notation right there. And so a data frame is a combination uh, it's, a, it's a matrix that has multiple uh, types of, um, of data stored within it. So letters are characters, and so you can store them along with numbers within a, a data frame. And so if we look at that, sorry if it's low down, but you can see that this first column, those are characters, and then it's the same matrix that we had earlier. And so this is really nice, so you can, you can describe your... Um, you can have site names, you can have locations, you can have uh, factor levels and so forth within your data matrix, or within your data frame. So another uh, good thing about R is that you can subset data. So as I discussed earlier, we have this object X2, and within it you can, you can take out the third and the sixth element. So it was a vector, and so it'll take out the, the third and the sixth member of that object, right? Um, if we wanted to return the second column, the way that R stores uh, column and row information in matrix, matrices and data frames, the first, um, uh, the first number there should be a, the row, and the second number is the column. So here, if we just want the second column, um, we'll pull all of that information. If we wanted the first row and the second column, we'd put a a one there. I, I should have made that a little bit more clear. So does that make sense? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Right, so there's the second, uh, second column that we wanted. R also has a bunch of logical operators. Um, so we have exactly equal to, um, 
is in is not uh, not an object and or greater than or less than greater than or equal to um, so we can use these to identify other specific qualities within a data frame or an object um, that we we might want to use uh, for example if I wanted to return a data frame uh, when the second column here is greater than or is less than 15, we can use a, sim a, a notation like that. And so here we just want the rows. So these are all of the rows, um, or rather we want, yeah. And so we'll get something that looks like that. So we get all of the, all of the rows where um, x2 is, is less than 15. So you can use all of these operators that um, I described earlier in a similar fashion. Oh, sorry, that's a, that's a big one. I should have mentioned that earlier. So when you have a data frame, that's how you can reference a column by name, right? So where was my data frame? Oh, I guess it was back here. So my data frame here, the, the column name is x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. And so I can, I can say specifically I want this column using that dollar sign. Yeah, you can name the column whatever you want. So I could have said um, location, and then I could have said weight, height, um, something like that. And you can name them accordingly. So, yeah. so, so Scott, if, yeah. you didn't, if you didn't have the, the dollar sign, what, what, do you, what do you get out? Uh, if you didn't have the dollar sign, it would have selected all of the data below 15. So it, it, and it would have sent an error because uh, yeah. Um, is that okay? So a function does something. So an object is uh, uh, your data, and your functions do something to that uh, to that data. So R has a ton of functions. Uh, you can plot 3D graphics. You can download data from servers, and you can check the the system time on your computer. So there's a ton of different functions that you can use, um, and they basically tell your computer to do something, right? So the mean of that column x2 is 15.5. So all of your functions, they have, um, they have these parentheses here that specify that within that, um, within that parentheses, this is the function that I, uh, this is what the object uh, that needs to be added upon or whatever, right? So we can also do some functions with character strings. So remember the first column was um, a string of characters. So the range of that first column is between C and L. So that takes the lowest and the highest, okay? So you can also do min, max, um, and so forth. And so that's one of the hardest things about R is it's a new language. And so there's often times when you know that there should be a function that does something, but you just can't imagine what the name would be. And so that's where it's helpful to search on Google or whatever. The problem with that is that the creators of R didn't really come up with the most um, creative name. And so when you search for just R, you get a whole bunch of different, um, a whole bunch of different uh, results. But if you use the, um, the central R, what is it, Cran? Central R... The what? I'm sorry. Well, it was in your slide, in your earlier slide, R C R E N. Right, R CRAN, yeah. So that stands for something, but I, I, I'm blanking on the name. R Central Archive Network. Right? What's the name? R. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, may, may, may the R starts the name, R. Yeah. I think I follow you. Um, so we can also have these functions that are, are just normal mathematical operators or mathematical functions. So the plus sign, the minus sign. Um, so that's adding those two columns together or those two vectors together, I'm sorry. And then you can also do things like matrix multiplication where you multiply those two vectors together. And so here again is, the, um, is that commented out area there that sort of specifies what it is. 
So you can also design your own function, which um, can seem a little bit intimidating to some at first, but it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, so you use this, this function. Uh, so you say this function is going to act on this object x. And then you put this curly bracket here. And then you put whatever you want in there that, that, um, that will be your function. So here, if we want to do the sum of x divided by the length of x, that would, that would give you the mean, right? And so then you follow that up with this other, other curly Q bracket here. And then, so now you have this function that's called my mean func, right? And so if you have a vector of numbers and you, uh, you, can, you can basically write your own functions. Does that make sense? So that's just the notation of how, how you might want to do that. So returning objects, so I'm, I make this awesome vector or this awesome matrix or data frame or something like that, but I want to look at it, how, how do I do that? So you can do that a couple of different ways. So you can just use the print command or you can just uh, type x2 or whatever, whatever your object is and it'll return what you need. And then if you're working with a function, if you put the return uh, function, that'll, that'll help out also. Um, so when, when you're doing uh, a script in R, if you want to call in data or if you want to save data to a particular location, it's helpful to, to have a working directory. So that's basically saying um, within this directory, uh, this is where you should look for data or this is where you should save the data. Um, so this, this symbol tilde slash there, that specifies the root directory. So on, on my computer, um, that's the the application, or it, it um, is the root directory there. So that's the Scott slash user directory. Um, and so if we wanted to create, so this, this function right here looks for the directory uh, where the root directory is. So you can also create, uh, create folders and so forth within R. And so that can be helpful if you, if you want to have a big run of things and you want to add data uh, or save data into a particular um, folder, you can create it using this uh, directory create function. And so I created this directory um, for Ember, the R primer, and then I wanted to save some data in there, and so then it makes it really easy to do that. Um, so to load data, within you, you first you should specify your working directory. So um, Am I losing you all, or is this? Yeah, be good. Uh, would it be easier to just open up a R window and go through this, or? Yes. Yes. Okay. We can do that. I don't know if I can type like that. Though. Um. Okay, so this is the R Studio console. Have you all used R Studio before? Some people have, yeah. Um, so it's a really nice interface. Right. So it's a really nice interface that you can um, that you can use to do your analyses or whatever. Sorry, this is really throwing me off that I can't see it on my computer. Um, So I'll figure it out here. Hold on. Okay. All right. So if we wanted to. Too big? Is that good? Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so... All right. So we can set our working directory and then we can make sure that we did that correctly. So we can look at the directory and I've already put a bunch of data in here that I was gonna play with later. Um, so we can read in we can read in data using this re read CSV function here. So um, we have the directory there, and so you look at the data. So I want to open this um, VP bent so forth, right? And so since it's a it's a character string, you need to put it in quotations. And I don't want, or I I do want the header. So this is just an Excel an Excel file. So I guess I can um, just hit enter, and it'll bring in this benthic data, right? So if you wanted to look at the, at the first couple rows of this data, we can do, we can look at the, um, the header function. And so, um, it's a really, maybe this is easier. So you can't really see that from here, but basically the way that the data is organized is you have station, date, and then you have a whole bunch of water quality parameters and then you have latitude, longitude, depth, and so forth. So it looks like it's all loaded in correctly. Um, yeah? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's simply just read CSV. So, um, so its file is saved as a comma, comma separated file. And... Right, right. So if, um, so if I just change the directory using this set working directory thing again. Pardon? I no, they're not, but I will No 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 you can't yeah, sorry. Um, so if we change the working directory back to the root directory and we try to load the data, it's gonna say, sorry, there's no data there because it's not located within that working directory. Um, if you don't want to keep all of your data within a working directory, you can also just specify it there. Oh, I have to put this other part. Specify. Right, and so then it found it again because I told, I told the full address of where it needed to go. So the set working directory just re really just makes a, um, a shortcut for you. Is that, is that good? Um, so if you're dealing with, um, if you're really dealing with a lot of data, you should keep in mind uh, storage. And one really nice thing about R is it has a, um, it has its own data saving compression algorithm or something like that. And it's called R data. And so you can, you can really, decrease the size of a file by saving it in that way. So, um, so we can save it as an R data file by doing that. Nope, you can't. So at this point, when you get a couple of errors, you can just look at the help, which you can call like that. And so with this RStudio, it'll bring, um, it'll bring this little help window up. And so I think the problem is that I need to Um, 
OK, there we go. <laughs> so the problem was that R, um, R is really smart, but it's only as smart as the operator. And so in this case, um, so when you have the save function, um, it requires a couple of things. So uh, here's the names of the objects that need to be saved. And then you want a list of all of the objects. And then you want the file. So what I was trying to make it do was I was trying to save, um, save this object, this little character string here, as bint, right? And so it couldn't figure out what this, this function or this, uh, this object bint was. So now, um, so this is an interesting thing here also. Right, so you just need to specify that it's a file. Right. Um, so which of the lists better? Uh, they're really the same. It's just whichever you can remember, <laughs> which I obviously didn't. So um, it just assigns one to the other. No, so they're the same. So uh, the order of the so you first put the the name of the objects that you want to save. And then you, you put a list containing the name of the operators you want to save, and then the file. And so when you, right. So I guess the point that I was trying to make here was that the R data is a pretty efficient way of, um, of saving data. Right, so if we look at the size, so it's 372 kilobytes as an R data file, or it's, really, is it bigger? <laughs> or it's actually smaller as a CSV. So completely ignore everything that I just said. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Anyway. Um, Okay, anyway, so in summary, this is just a quick little thing here. Uh, summary R is, works really well. It's as good as the user is. Um, and it takes time, so be patient. And don't be afraid to look for help or ask for help or, or so forth. Um, so with that, are there any questions? This is just a real, yeah. I guess, I guess it focuses then on what your question is, right? So what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day life is analyzing empirical data. If you're pulling down huge paleo files or what uh, the GFL, what did? Yeah, 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 like your gigantic one terabyte per day files, like that's obviously not going to, I guess it's knowing what you want to do. R is really good at at doing statistics, R is really good at managing data frames. Um, R is really good at just having graphics right there. I know MATLAB can do a lot of that, but it is, um, but it is a, it is not a free, right? Beth, do you have any other thoughts on? What is it called? Uh, the Julia Blanchard's is a size. What's it? If you just do a Google search on Julia Blanchard, you'll find her brand one through all of the fishery stock assessment methods for ICs are on R. So there's this big this big push in the fisheries world at least to put all of their model types and indicator processing steps up on R. So that you don't have to go through the kind of what we all went through for the last ten years. You can benefit from from that. So the open library Downside to that is you've got to figure out which one's the best one and you've got to think different options, but 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our, I, I guess what, what, your, what your question is, is like a, does you, R handle big uh, data sets better than MATLAB? Does it yes. occupy more space on your computer? Yes. Oh, no, it's, it's pretty small. It's like 30 megabytes or something. Or, the data? Well, uh, the data is just as big as the data. I, I didn't mean the uh, actual uh, space the R uh, language takes. I yeah. mean the, uh, the memory of the computer. Say if I run MATLAB program on computer, uh, take a lot of memory CPU, and so uh, I cannot do other things very, very fast. Yeah. So I wonder if R has the same issue on that. R is pretty, pretty lightweight in that. Okay, that, that's for, I mean, that's for some, good advantage. For my purposes, but your, your experience may differ. I don't know. Okay. I, um, I've slowed the computer down to a crawl before, but it's not common. Yeah. Okay, thanks. R versus other? Well, yeah, and that's one of the interesting things about R is because it's user developed, right? So if, if you are the user and you develop kind of sloppy code, then, it, you know, so there is that warning that is sort of, you need to be able to, to know that what you're using is good and so you should kick the tires, as they say, to understand what is going on. But oftentimes that means that there's redundancies or... Yeah, there are wrappers for those other types of things. Yeah. Beth might be able to speak more to that. All right. So there's a, a quick intro. Um, it's called the, yeah. the fun question for you. Okay. When you were uh, writing that function, mm -hmm. right, trying to save the thing, you said no. No. So how many notes do you say when you code a, a typical program? <laughs> how many did I? Or how many, how many do, do you normally? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a joke, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> the, four. Four. <laughs> Four or forty-two yeah, depends more, on yeah, yeah. <laughs> depends on where the boss is. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that was that was that, and so now we have the next one. If I can. All right, so now we can look at some data. Um, this is really hurting my brain, I'm sorry. <laughs> All these different things. Um, okay. Okay, so... All right, so the paper that I, I sent to you all, um, the Elaine Zuer 2010 Methods in Ecology and Evolution paper, um, it sort of came at a time where 
there, you know, a lot of people are doing, obviously ecology has been around for quite a while now, but a lot of problems were evident in some analyses because people weren't really taking the time to go through some of the, the basic um, exploration of the data before, um, before they got deep into their analyses. And so what I wanted to do just really quickly is to sort of go over, <clears throat> go over these. I know that you all have taken stats and that you're familiar with everything, but I wanted to sort of demonstrate how you can use these tools in R um, to, to come up with um, ideas of how good your data is or what type of assumptions you might be violating and so forth. So the data exploration, uh, generally you're looking for outliers, uh, homogeneity of Y, uh, normality, you want to avoid zero trouble. So if you have a thousand zeros and four, data, or four other values, you might have a problem. Um, collinearity, relationships between Y and X, and interactions between covariates and independence of Y. So these are, um, this is the list that he said are some of the main issues with some ecological data. So I, um, I got some data from the Ecological Archives, which the Ecological Society of America, they have a journal called uh, Ecological Archives where people can send in data. And so it's, um, uh, you can also actually, I don't know if I'm actually connected to the, um, another good, another good place to find data that I found this data at was the IOBIS. Has anybody looked at this before? The Ocean Biogeographic Information System. Um, yeah, so that's where I found this data and it works pretty well. So anyway, so the, the data is from an uh, Estuary Bay and Tidal River Survey along the Virginian province, which is from Cape Cod down to um, Mississippi, or uh, uh, North Carolina or so. Um, and the data was incredibly messy. And so I can, I can send you all the code that I used to make it actually readable. But basically, here I'll show you how ugly it was. Um, so that's the clean data. All right, so it was all saved as text files. Where is the text file? There it is. So, so the benthic data set that I'll be looking at is somewhere. There it is, benthic community. Right, so here it is as a text file. And so this is how it's saved on their, on their website. So can you think of some issues with this? This is just a data sort of question, right? So you have all this metadata, which that's great, but when you try to import data that has metadata on the top of it, it's kind of a pain. And that it also has, um, some of these are, are tab delimited and some of them are actual spaces. And so anyway, they also have, multiple files that they have the same type of, of uh, delimiter, but it's also within specific columns. So anyway, so it was a terribly messy data set that I pulled together a, a while ago. Um, and so the question is, how is benthic community diversity influenced by environmental parameters, right? So that's a pretty simple question. Um, here's a study of, or here's a map of all of the, um, all of the areas that they, they did their study. Um, and so that was actually a pretty simple little map that I put together with R. So I'm trying to see if I can do both here. So these different libraries, I didn't really mention that, um, but they are the different packages that people can put together. And so 
here's the code for that. It's kind of hard to read. Um, basically, you, you you call these different um, these different libraries, map tools, which has a lot of map tools and maps that has a bunch of maps already built into it. And then you just read in the file and then um, adjust some of the parameters which you can get into later. And then you make a plot, a plot of the US and then you add all of these different layers onto it. So it's pretty straightforward to, to do actually. Um, so anyway, so that, that's, the, that's the extent of the data. And so the biodiversity, um, so here we just plotted the, the biodiversity uh, as a function of the order of the data. And so in, if we were to have any big outliers, it would be sticking out above or below these, uh, these whiskers. Um, so generally, the, the data looks pretty good. Um, so this box plot function is how you get that first one, right? And so it's just looking at the, this object here, which is the benthic diversity for all 4, 000, um, or 400 stations. And then you can just add a, um, a Y lab, if you, uh, Y label if you wanted to. And then you can add legends and so forth uh, that make it a little bit more clear. And then the next one was the dot chart, um, which um, basically does the order of all of the data um, and so forth. Should I just email you guys the code right now? Would that be more interesting than, yes? Okay. Um, maybe I'll do it during the break. Would that be okay or, yeah. Um, right, so looking for outliers and then looking for outliers in X is a little bit different. Um, so this is, the, this is the order of all of the data. And so this is for uh, particulate radi or radiation density, depth, pH, uh, fluorescence, transmittance, and dissolved oxygen, temperature, and salinity, and so forth. Um, and so since it's an annual survey, or a couple times a year, you can really see some annual trends in some of this data. And so when you're going through the analysis process, that might be an important uh, thing to consider, um, whether or not you have those temporal patterns. Um, and so, This uses a, a package called Lattice, um, which basically creates a, um, that grid that you saw earlier. Um, um, right, so it takes the data and spreads it across, divides it by, uh, by variable and then spreads it across the, the, the lattice. Um, so homogeneity of Y, so that's looking to see, to make sure that the variance is the same over time. Uh, and, and that can be evaluated in regression type models by, by looking at the residual versus fitted values. Um, and we can do that afterwards. And so the normality, um, this is pretty easy to do also. You just look at the distribution of the data. So here's the observed distribution. Uh, this is the density of the data. And so that looks pretty normal. And then if you just simulated data with the same length uh, and for it uh, fit a normal density curve, um, that's what you might expect, right? So here it looks like we have pretty, pretty normal data. Um, and so we can do that by using the um, these histograms here where it just looks at the, um, you split the data into the number of classes there, which is 15 um, throughout the whole data set. And then the, the density, which you can do the same way. And then create a, a sample data set there, which is this random normal, which has the mean of the uh, diversity, and then the standard deviation of the diversity, and then look at the, at the distribution of that. Right. Um, so 
zero trouble if we have a bunch of zeros in the data set, um, we would need to address that. Here it looks like there aren't really any zeros. Um, so one way that you can plot that pretty easily is to um, to use this table function. So it basically um, it basically rounds your data into little bins, and so it uh, here I specified that I wanted it by the one digit, so it creates these bins. And so if there were a bunch of zeros, they would fall into that zero bin. Um, and then you can just create a plot of this. So this is an example of where you can uh, put a bunch of different functions within, um, within a single function. So I round the data first. And then plot it. Right? Um, So then collinearity, uh, so that's where you have correlation between covariates. And this ends up being really small here, but um, on the, we have all of the, the uh, x variables on the x and, y val uh, x and y axes, and then we have the covariance between the two of them. The blue numbers are uh, zero, and then the yellow numbers are one, so it's the absolute value. So here, density and salinity and uh, depth are all correlated, which you would probably imagine from uh, an ecological or uh, environmental parameters. Um, and so this, this is also using this lattice plot. And so you take the correlation of, um, of all of the data that is complete, and then you make the little colors. Um, and then you can you can just plot it like that. So I don't you can see it a little bit better there. Um, so these are some of the figures that you can make using different packages within R. There's the lattice package. There's the base graphics and and some of the others. And they all require a little bit different syntax, but um, they can be pretty powerful and attractive if you if you do it correctly. Obviously, you wouldn't want to put that in a paper, but um, it makes a nice, pretty picture. And so you can also look for relationships between y and x. Um, so this is a scatter plot of the covariates on the x-axis and then the biodiversity on the y-axis. And so this is a way that you can quickly look at how, how data is distributed. And then this line here is a simple lowest smoother, which um, we'll talk about in a little bit. And basically, um, we might have a couple of relationships here, and we might need to transform a couple of things. So this this right here, it looks like it might not have a, a uh, it might have a log distribution or something like that. Um, so that makes it easy to to see how you how you need to um, how you might need to transform or if you have other errors associated. And so this code is really kind of long. Um, and then that'll render it there. Um, so interactions, uh, but we're, we're not looking at multivariate responses, so we don't need to worry about interactions between multiple uh, diversity matrices. Um, but it might be helpful to look for interactions between um, uh, the x variables. So independence, we sort of uh, assume that all of these measurements are independent and the, the real issue is temporal and spatial uh, autocorrelation which we would look at in our model selection process. Um, so we don't really worry about that right now. And so just quickly, um, linear models, I know you guys all know linear models but I just sort of wanted to discuss how easy they are in, in R. Um, so you have your simple linear regression, uh, multiple explanatory variables, you can change it a little bit, and then you have uh, uh, your nonlinear relationships. Um, so with R, maybe I can make that. There, that's better, right? Um,
so to 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 just do the linear uh, linear models really quick, we can just make up some data here. So uh, this set seed here. So if you're doing anything that has random iterations or anything like that, uh, it's important to set your seed because this is this is where the random number generator um, starts. And so I usually just set it as one, two, three. Um, and so that way I always know that the random numbers are going to be the same. And so that's helpful when you're doing um, when you're doing uh, replicates or something like that, right? And so I want to specify the slope here as 2.3 and then add a little bit of normal distributed error um, just for fun. And so here we can here we can create some fake data here. So we have our random numbers multiplied by the slope plus error, right? And so we can we could plot we can plot M1 maybe. Right, so that looks fine. And then if we want to look at how where did we go? Right. And then if we wanted to look at the relationship with um, between the two variables here, we can do that. And so we can see that there's probably a pretty good linear relationship between the two of them. Um, and so we can look at the linear model here. So that's LM, LM, and then this model formulation here. So it's the uh, response variable as a function. So the tilde is the uh, as a function of L1. And so if there were other properties that we needed to access um, within this L, the linear model function, you can look at the um, here uh, using RStudio, you can hit tab while you're on a function and it'll start um, It'll create a list of all of the different things that you could uh, include in there. Um, no, that's. There we go. Right, so you want to specify your formula, data, and then you can do subsets and weights and then take care of um, missing data and uh, so forth, right? So there's a lot that you can do with the simple in your model. And if you wanted to just look at um, how your model is specified there, you can just look at, you can just call the model, right? And you can also look at the summary. And so here, this is the, this is the summary code or the summary output for a normal linear model. And so you have your, um, there's your, there's your beta and your alpha, and then your standard error, your t value, and then your significance levels here. So here we can see that the, that the variable L1 does have a significant uh, linear relationship with M1, or M1 has a significant linear relationship with L1. Um, and so then you can look at your standard error uh, your adjusted R squared. And so one of the cool things with R also is you can pull out these, uh, these different attributes of the summary of the uh, model with this attributes function. So you can, you can see all of the things that are sold are stored in the um, summary or in the model here. And so if we wanted to just pull out the R squared, Um, 
you can you can just type it like that. Is that does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so there's a quick example of the linear model. Uh, like I, you can you can add all of these other things to make the the plots a lot more attractive. So here I um, I pulled out the model coefficients, which I included up here. So there's one of the model coefficients. Um, and then I added an ab line with those model coefficients. So that's like a, a, a line of that slope. And so that's the, the best fit line. Um, and then, as we discussed earlier, it's important to check out your residual error, error. So we can look at the residual error here with the resid function. And you can just look at it for the model. And then you can also plot that data um, and see if, if that meets our assumptions. So here it looks like there's no real pattern of our residuals. And so we probably don't have to worry about any type of uh, correlation or anything like that. So what happens if we have, so this is all of this. Um, so what happens if we have a, a poor fit, right? Um, so I guess one of the big questions oftentimes when you're using different models is, do you have a linear or nonlinear relationship? And so to move towards the next bit here, um, we're going to look at uh, how you can tell if something is nonlinear. So, um, so we'll, we'll change the function a little bit to add a nonlinear relationship. So here, um, here we can, So this is the results from that nonlinear function here. Um, and we can see that the that it isn't significant here. So the p-value of this L2 is 0 0.90. So that really doesn't do a very good job explaining the model. However, we know that it, it is in this. So here's the here's the nonlinear model that I made. So it's the effect of L1 plus the sine time, the sine function of 3 times pi times L2. And so we actually know that L2 should be a significant thing here, but it's, it's really not. And so um, to make sure that it's actually, it's actually what you're looking for, you can look at the, at the residuals here. And so this is the residuals for that model. And so you can plainly see that there's this sine wave going through the residuals. And so uh, um, obviously it's not, a, it's not a poor model fit, it's just a poor model, right? And so um, that'll sort of segue into the next bit where we'll talk a little bit about nonlinear models. Um, and so here's a comparison between L1 and of the residuals of the first bit and then of the second bit. So, um, right, does anybody have any questions about that? So that was just a real quick overview of some real simple. I know it must be excruciatingly painful to watch somebody type on the big screen or in general. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. We should use uh, different kinds of statistics, or like the Taylor diagram, for example, mm. or just on the mind group. Um. So I, I don't know if I fully understand your question, but this was just like made up data. Is that, so this would be how you might analyze empirical data. Um, is that sort of what, maybe I don't follow.
Oh, so you have like a model output yeah. from, okay. So comparing observational to, uh, to model. So I know that um, uh, some, some of the ways that Beth mentioned yesterday could be helpful for that. Um, using like the PCA and, and those sorts of things to see if they lump out together. Um, is that what you're saying is if you compare your, your observational to your model output in a, to look for a linear relationship, is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or nonlinear, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? I know that was real quick, but I'll, I, I promise that I have stuff that is pretty easy to... You'll have the code. <laughs> and that's how I've learned so much, is just by looking at other people's code also. So. Should I repeat? I don't have one thought. I thought, if, say, if you send hours a small data file, mm -hmm. then uh, you can uh, teach us how to, I don't know, calculate uh, means, uh, mean or cal so correlation. Right? Yeah, I think that's what we, we all can play on computer with that data set. I think that probably be more okay. uh, intuitive. Then we just watch you do it. Yeah. We cannot do it here. Uh, Mm -hmm. people find it easier. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Yep. Okay. Um I'll probably yeah, probably yeah. now two data small data sets and mm -hmm. we can follow your play our computer with okay. yeah. Um Okay. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I just